this is our last official full day, um, we want you to get as much as you can. It's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce George Ray today. George lives in Moscow, Idaho. He is a professor of art in the College of Art and Architecture at the University of Idaho. He teaches painting and drawing at the graduate and undergraduate levels. As an artist, drawing and painting remain foundational in reference and in the making of his work. Light has always been an integral part of the process, whether natural or imposed. A retrospective glance shows an introduction of neon in 1976. This generated a shift toward more three-dimensional images that ranges from light sculptures to installations. George is an accomplished artist. His art is included in museums and galleries throughout the Northwest. He has an impressive exhibition record that reveals his mastery with the medium of light. In addition to the inclusion of his work in collections, he has received numerous residential commissions. George is a skilled teacher. In the painting classes at North Idaho College last week, students participated in a workshop that he gave, which was entitled Sites. And during the month of March through today, his exhibit is at Union Gallery, and you will find that in the Student Union Building. The exhibit, the workshop, the gallery walk, the slide lecture presentations have given students a wealth of information and ideas. What George does, how he makes his work, is a very involved process that requires lots of tenacity, ingenuity, patience, and knowledge. And these qualities belong to George. His topic today for the slide lecture presentation is Art in the Environment Confronting Ecological Issues. He will address art's influence in the environment historically with a focus on contemporary ecological issues. Please feel free to ask questions after the presentation and to join him at Union Gallery for a closing reception of his exhibit between 12 and 1. Please welcome George Ray. I have to turn on all these gadgets here first. You would think that since I work with all these gadgets, I'd be used to them by now, but, uh, but it always takes some adjustment. Um, the, um, the arts are really, you know, innate to the characteristics of, of, of human being. It's an innate characteristics of human beings. And as a result, uh, there's been a long involvement um, and association of the arts with the environment. First, it was the natural environment. And then it became the natural environment and the man-made environment. And in the second half of the 20th century, it's becoming the man-made environment versus the natural environment. And so what I want to do is briefly talk about that history and that association that, uh, that art has had with, uh, with the environment. And, and of course, in the process of, of doing this, I, uh, all of the arts have played a role to one degree or another. But since I'm a visual artist, uh, most of what I'm going to show uh, will be the, the visual arts. The physical grandeur and forces of nature have always inspired both awe and fear in people. Although the ages Although all through the ages, uh, attempts were made to understand and harness the power of human to human advantage. From the first prehistoric tools shaped over two million years ago, the current uh, to the current experiments in generic genetic engineering, humans have modified nature. As early people transformed the environment, they developed spiritual beliefs, uh, mediated a balance uh, of relationships with the earth, a supernatural. Let me get this on here. A supernatural unity with the world of animals uh, was experienced by the hunter and the gatherers. Agricultural communities venerated the sacred tree and the great goddess to ensure the, the continuity of the seasons, the fertility of the land. And in these pre-industrial societies, objects of art dramatized myths and rituals 
that revolved, that revolved around the life-generating powers of nature, growth, death, and renewal, to convey the mysterious and the sacred essence of terrestrial and celestial realms, art, as well as dance and music, evolved as an integral part of life. Over the centuries, the intimate relationship previously established between peoples, animals, and earth eroded, and the estrangement accelerated during the Industrial Revolution. In the beginning, changes to the landscapes were limited in scope and initiated relatively slowly by people living in small uh, communities and small populations. By contrast, the rapid pace and the global scale of the current population uh, and the destruction of nature uh, is without precedent. In those prehistoric groups, the individuals responsible for the physical, emotion, and spiritual well-being of the group was the shaman, who still is a powerful uh, figure in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies. Shamans are visionaries whose prophetic dreams and powerful sense of intuition are responsible for the healing and for the maintaining the rituals that foster a group cohesion. Most often, the shaman is also the artist, using objects of art to illuminate the meaning and to heighten the drama of ceremonies. In today's technological society, the artist does not carry the power, is that me? <laughs> does not carry the power uh, or position of a shaman, but artists are still in the unique position to affect change because they can synthesize new ideas, they can communicate connections between many disciplines. They are pioneering a holistic approach to problem solving that transcends the narrow limits of specialization. Since art embodies freedom of thought, spirit, and expression, its creative potentials are limitless. Art changes the way people look at reality. The most, and, and in the most positive mode, it can offer an alternative vision. In the 19th, in 19th century landscape painting, the artist greatly influenced the understanding of the planet and its relation to natural history. The paintings of William Turner, Frederick Church, Thomas Cole enabled students of science to visualize concepts of erosion, glaciation, and other natural forces that contribute to the formation of the planet. By joining navigational exploration and survey teams, artists were able to paint every type of terrain on all continents, including Antarctica. Their works also stimulated a heightened interest in, uh, in the earth and the appreciation for its indigenous personnel, excuse me, indigenous, indigenous population. Mountains, symbols of wilderness, once considered by Christian theologians as too dismal and ungodly a setting for human beings, inspired some of the greatest paintings of the 19th century. Landscape paintings of the Alps, the Rockies, and the Andes encouraged tourism to these areas. Artists often made topographical sketches that were later engraved and colored and then published in travel guides. So began the age of the travelogue and the continued influence of art in the Western expansion. Writers and poets were also caught up in the enthusiasm of discovery uh, art writers such as William Wood Wordsworth, uh, Walt Whitman, all of whom contributed to the merging of culture and nature during a period of intensifying industrialization. The majority of Western landscape painters ignored the realities of conquest and exploration of nature. Many of the artists welcomed the arrival of the railroad since it gave them access to the natural wonders of the continent. While political leaders, industrialists, and segments of the, of the public may themselves have viewed the works as celebrating the conquest of nature, these same landscapes acted as catalysts for its preservation. Landscape painters and photographers who returned east with awesome views influenced the formation of national parks. And although the motivation for establishing these parks was for many primarily aesthetic, Rather than ecological, it was the first attempt to protect, nature, to protect resources from the grip of development. 
Yosemite Valley, the world's first natural preserve, was set aside as a state park in 1864. The establishment of Yellowstone Park followed in 1872, the year that Thomas Moran painted, painted the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, which, by the way, was purchased by the federal government. In this painting, the artist and his fellow explorers are reduced to insignificance by the eroded cliffs and the giant trees. Two men standing on the edge of a precipice gaze across a vast chasm to a distant waterfall, and Moran's elevated perspective provides the viewer with an even greater panorama, which includes the Rocky Mountains and the, st and the steam from erupting geysers. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution had transformed the cities with the introduction of the factory. During the Roaring Twenties, machines and industry seized the artist's imagination. Great wealth was generated and many American artists seized, the, seized, the, their, it seized their imagination and they depicted the power and the glory of the expanding technology by painting skyscrapers, power plants, and factories. American artists like Charles Sheeler largely ignored the negative effects of industrialization. The American landscape, which was painted in 1930, uh, a view of the, auto, of the Ford Automobile Factory in River Road, Michigan, he asserts the supremacy of a new industrial scenery. Until this time, landscape had been composed of trees, mountains, and other natural features, which were an important source of spiritual enlightenment. In American landscape, Sheeler implies the power of spiritual enlightenment has been conferred upon technology. A sense of eternity is evoked by the uncanny tranquility and the order of the scene. Pristinely composed, the painting is dominated by white, which sanitizes even the pollution from the smokestack. Sheeler and many other American artists depicted a utopian industrial realm, realm devoid of flesh and blood. Popularized during, popularized during the 30s, these scenes rarely acknowledge the squalid conditions of the factory workers, which were documented by photojournalists who photographed children in sweatshops, coal mines, and factories in the eastern United States. In reality, the industrial cities of the United States were deteriorating, and so was the countryside. The year of the greatest damage was in 1938, when over 23 million acres were depleted of two and a half to five inches of topsoil. <clears throat> only, only the photographers and the painters and the paintings that remain portray the trauma to the people and the land. Photographers sponsored by the Farm Security Administration documented the conditions of migrant workers and the environment in the Southern Plains referred to by news journalists as the Dust Bowl. Were it not for artists like Dorothea Lang, Arthur, Ro Arthur Rothstein, as well as writers like John Steinbeck, whose grapes of wrath are still widely read, the Dust Bowl would have been forgotten by the public. And indeed, the tragedy of the Dust Bowl was soon forgotten. As World War II drew to a close, the United States experienced a business boom that pro propelled the most intense years of industrialization. The extraordinary growth of agriculture, timber, plastics, and chemical industries created a gap by which we further distance ourselves from nature. Everything that was once made from natural materials was thus recycl recyclable, degradable, was replaced by synthetics, requiring huge expenditures of en energy, energy in the form of non-renewable fossil fuels to produce. The residue of the process of production left a toxic wake of mercury, PCBs, benzenes, and heavy metals that entered the streams and the landfills to contaminate water supplies, as depicted in this painting by Alexander Hoag, Mother Earth Laid Bare. Overjoyed by the, by the fact that the economy was moving again after the years of the Great Depression, most people, including the artists, barely noticed. The mid-1940s through the 50s saw the United States continue a rapid growth. Abstract Expressionism, the U.S. first international movement, gave U.S. art and artist an international reputation and independence from centuries of a dominating European art scene. 
by the late 50s through the 60s, pop art, U.S. second major art movement. This is the, the abstract expressionism. And then pop art, focused on the objects of mass consumption popularized by the media. Artists like James Rosenquist, Andy Warhol, celebrated society's affluence uh, and absorption with their products. Through paintings, collage, sculptures, and prints of cigarettes, beer, Wonder Bread, Coca-Cola, artists depicti depicted the trappings of the 20th century life without criticism or social commentary. By focusing on the objects of our culture, the pop art movement, although without criticism at first, did begin to make artists aware of the widening gap between people and the natural world. By the mid-60s, artists responded to the growing environmental awareness by interpreting nature in radically new ways. Thus, the earth art, or the environmental art movement, was born. This broad-based movement of artists shared two key concerns in the 1960s. They rejected the commercialization of art and the support of the emerging ecological movement with its back, back to the land anti-urbanism and sometimes spiritual attitude towards the planet. There was a return to the landscape which resulted in some of the most astonishing and difficult in art yet to be seen. A traditional subject, the landscape nevertheless was treated in the most untraditional way. Rather than representing it, in paint, on canvas, or in rhythms of steel, a handful of artists chose to enter the landscape itself, to use its materials, and to work with its salient features. They were not depicting the landscape, but they were engaging it. Their art was not simply of the landscape, but in it as well. From the 60s, from the mid-60s to the present, earth art has evolved through many through many movements and concepts that, that make up the central environmental art today. And what I would like to do now is briefly show some examples uh, of the early earthworks, as they were called, and how they progressed uh, up to the present, the present ecolo ecological uh, approach to the environment. Of course, this, let me back up here. This is work by Robert Smithson. It was called the Spiral Jetty. Uh, he, he started construction on it in 1969, and it was finished in, in 1970. It's located in the Great Salt Lake, in the very north, north end of the lake. The image comes from the Indian, uh, is associated with, with an Indian image that uh, relates to the center of the universe, the spiraling, uh, center that many of the Indians felt was the Great Salt Lake. Uh, since it is such a high salt solution, there, was a there is a continuous change of color uh, that occurs as the water gets isolated within the spiral so that you have a continual change of color. Taking advantage of a natural situation and using, uh, using basically the earth to, to strike that effect. The early earthworks I call making a mark because there was still an attitude with artists um, usually associated with the romantic period of having to make a mark, having to make a real presence uh, in this case in the landscape. This is the work of Walter de Maria. It's called the Las Vegas piece. Three miles long in a very fragile environment. This was completed in 1969 and it's still there today. Michael Heiser worked on the, the edge of a, of a plateau and uh, removed a tremendous amount of dirt to uh, cut through the natural erosion that occurred on, on the edge of, of the plateau. But there was a slightly different attitude with, with Michael Heiser, even though he wanted to make an extreme mark of man in the environment, he knew that also it would erode and that eventually and that eventually 
it would become much like the area, the eroded, the natural eroded area around around the uh, the butte. Then there were also a, gr a group of artists that I call raising the awareness or heightening your senses. Um, this is the work of Richard Long. Richard Long is an Englishman who follows the tradition of the English and their walks. And he walks all over the world. And his, his marks are indications, uh, are markers within these walks that indicate certainly his presence, but it's done in, in a way that is uh, ethereal, that uh, does not create a permanent mark on the landscape, but is obviously something that's done by man. This is uh, a circle in the Andes. The top picture is a line in the Himalayas. And the bottom, excuse me, Now we'll get it. And the bottom picture is a line in Scotland. Andy Goldsworthy picks a site. Uh, he's also an Englishman. Picks a site and concentrates on the material and using, <coughs> using the salient features of those materials to construct uh, very temporary, in many cases they're very temporary, very delicate kinds of structures that are out of the natural materials. He introduces no man-made materials using all, all of the materials that are found at the site. Some involved certainly a great deal of time and become somewhat more permanent. But again, it's not an intrusion. And some are just to capture a passing of a very natural event, such as a snowstorm. Taking other natural materials and using them in a way that they regard the laws of nature, of gravity, or they take into consideration the natural changes of temperature, of light, and gravity as well. In 1969, or in the mid-1960s, Alan Sonfest, who is an American artist who works in the urban area, uh, works in urban cities, um, started a project called the Time Landscape. And it was planted in 1978. And it was planted with plants and seeds that were native to this particular area. And this site is in Greenwich Village in New York. But these plants and seeds were native to this area 300 years ago. It's also sometimes called the colonial garden. And so he deliberately takes man's environment and introduces, in this case, the plants and seeds that were, were native to that area before man's environment was present. Walter DeMaria did it, started a project uh, in the early or in the late 70s, completed in, uh, in the early 80s, called the lightning field. The idea being that it takes advantage of, of and emphasizes natural phenomenon that happen within nature. Uh, the lightning field is situated in a high mountain prairie in New Mexico, 8,500 feet and above sea level. There's a, the characteristic of this particular area is that from May to September, lightning storms pass through that area pass through that area very quickly. The lightning field is composed of 1,600 lightning rods that are laid out in a grid a mile long and a kilometer wide. And they're made of stainless steel. And in this pristine valley, seeing the stainless steel lightning rods uh, create a very fascinating uh, connection between technology, and not necessarily a new technology. Lightning rods have been around for a long time, uh, and nature. James Terrell is another artist who's been working in, in an extinct volcano since the early 70s, and uh, it's called the Roden Crater. Um, 
the idea being is that being that it would take advantage of phenomenon that happened within the atmosphere uh, that happened celestially uh, he's a pilot and he in the Syri in the process of flying uh, all over the country uh, he's noticed that between 400 and 400 feet and 1,000 feet, the horizon takes on a slightly concave configuration. And when it does that, you get the phenomenon of atmospheric vaulting. And so part of the aspect of this crater will deal with that atmospheric vaulting, but it will also deal with a series of chambers that are designed to hone down your senses, to reconcentrate your senses, on different kinds of phenomenon from quasars to Gansfield's effects to right to darkness rising and um, and uh, he has a uh, there will be a moon chamber that will actually project the image of the moon into it Christo Christo wraps things covers things stretches things uh, and in a way that makes you aware of the environment in very unique and unusual ways. This is the wrapped coast. That's Little Bay, Australia. It was one million square feet of cloth and rope. The running fence was in Sonoma, Marin counties. It ran from 26 ran for 26 miles from the coast, going over the landscape. Uh, making you extremely aware of configurations, make you extremely aware of the, not only the, the landscape itself, but the, the environment that's around it. The, um, he also did a project in Florida called the Surrounded Islands, where he wrapped a series of islands. Um, again, a way of, of making the beauty of an area even more accentuated with uh, the acts of, in this case, surrounding the islands with the bright pink uh, material. And by the late 70s and 80s, earth art had evolved for a few artists into environmental issues and concerns. And with that came uh, acts of reclamation and restoring, and most of all in collaboration with um, scientists, biologists, uh, people from all ranges of, of industry. This is a project that was completed in Kent, Washington in 1979. It's called Johnson Pit Number 30. It was a gravel pit that uh, was just outside of Seattle, and it was converted into an amphitheater uh, that uh, that is still still used. Uh, many of these projects also, I might mention, uh, are quite involved. And of course, the funding is, is always very essential. And uh, arts in public places have been uh, much of the center of the, of the funding. Arts in public places programs have been developed uh, not only by the National Endowment of the Arts, but also by cities, by counties, and by states throughout the US. Nancy Holt uh, has a project called Sky Mounds. Uh, she will transfer an entire, or transform an entire landfill in the meadowlands of Hack Hackensack, New Jersey into a public park and naked eye observatory. At the same time, the artist is creating a habitat for plants and some of the 250 mi uh, species of migratory birds that visit the area seasonally. At carefully calculated locations, on the site, earth mounds and steel poles will be placed to align the viewer's vision with the rising sun and the setting on the spring and fall equinox and summer and winter solstice. This contemporary stone hinge will also contain a network of gravel paths spilling down the sides of the landfill to further highlight the angles of the sun on these days. In another area of the sky mound, arcing methane will, will, wellheads will frame the moon in its extreme position in relation to the Earth, which occurs every 16.8 years. Betty Bowmark has, uh, has been working with a project called Ocean Landmarks uh, since, since the uh, late late 1970s. Uh, the Ocean Landmark has done several works with bo which both interpret and solve the environmental problems facing the ocean. 
Ocean landmark projects recycle waste and establish a habitat for fish. Using recycled coal to ash to fabricate 17,000 blocks of 17,000 blocks from 500 tons of recycled coal to ash. The project located on the continental shelf 50 miles from New York and is submerged in 70 feet of water. She collaborated with scuba divers, biologists, chemists, oceanographers, and engineers at Columbia University and the State University of New York at Stony Brook as well as Bell Laboratories for two years. Meryl Eucles is the first artist to devote herself primarily to the unglamorous but the paramount environmental issue of urban garbage. In this particular project, she covered the sides of the New York sanitation garbage trucks with mirrors uh, so that essentially they reflect the images of the people who create the garbage. By staking out this new territory, she pioneered an important issue long before it received widespread media attention. Her work demonstrates that waste management, recycling, and landfill reclamation can offer artists inspiration and an opportunity to, re to revitalize the, the urban ecology. Eucalyptus became affiliated with the New York City of Sanitation as artist in residence. She executed some remarkable artworks and dramatic public performances that attempted to heighten the public awareness of the problems associated with urban waste. Buster Simpson has been creating unique and varied bodies of varied and a varied body of ecological art since 1970. He's interpreted such air environmental issues as water pollution and proposed solutions to counter the damaging effect. In all the work he does there is, is, is always with a touch of humor and individuality that c contributes to the effectiveness of the art. In this piece he devised a solution to the poisoning of our waterways by releasing large hand-carved disks of limestone in rivers across the country. Conceived as a stopgap solution, the disk effectively neutralized the acidity of the water for a limited time. His first works were launched in the Toll River near, near Seattle and, and in New York. In 1990, the artist provided this medicinal aid to the headwaters of the Hudson River in New York's Adirondack Park. In a sense, Simpson's physical involvement in administering these disks often by wading into the water recalls ceremonial practice of Native American Indians who heal the sick through dramatic rituals. With river rollades, or Tums for Nature as he calls it, Simpson attempts to revive the ailing waters of our country through chemistry and art. Downspout plant monitoring system was another project of, of Buster Simpson. The project is at Pike Street Market in downtown Seattle. He grew ferns and plumbing attached to the side of the buildings. The work functioned as a water retention system for rain runoff from the city rooftops. He improved the, the acidic water by using limestone in the elbows before it entered the storm sewer systems. This made an ideal habitat for plants. He works, he works constantly with county, state, and, and city health uh, departments. <coughs> When the tide is out, the table is set, is the title of this project. In order to dramatize the issue of pollution, Simpson visually recorded the affluent pouring out from city sewer systems into the rivers. This project began in 1978 while he was working as an artist in resident at Art Pack in Lewiston, New York. Sections of which are situated on a toxic landfill near Love Canal. Simpson made concrete cast of plates used by art pack picnickers and placed them at sewage outfalls near, near the Niagara River. The plates were then exhibited and the, stands cre and, and the stains created from the contamination in the water. And in 1984, Simpson continued the project by casting plates in vitreous china as part of the Kohler Factory Art and Industry Program. After these, pla after, after citing these plates at sewage, sewage outfalls near the major cities, such as Cleveland, New York, Houston, and Seattle, 
for a long period of time. They become glazed with affluent. Simpson then fired them in a kill. The plates were often beautiful in pattern, and indeed the more colorful they were, the more toxic were the origins of the stain. The title, When the Tide is Out, the Table is Set, refers to an old Salish Indian saying about pure waters and feast of, self, of shellfish. And this poignant reversal of the state of nature, fish from our waters being unfit to eat, it is, that, it is here that Simpson makes a dramatic recall about the, about the, the situation in our times and in relation to our natural uh, in, in, in relation to our natural uh, qualities with, of life. Mel Chin <laughs> did a project called the Revival Field in 1990. Uh, he became involved in a process of using plants to detoxify waste sites. Revival Fields is, is an attempt to demonstrate the safe and natural means to clean up toxic waste from the soil. The project's success depends upon the capacity of a unique group of plants to absorb heavy metals through their vascular system. Revival fields consist of 60 square foot sections of landfill contamin contaminated by such heavy metals as cadmium that have seeped out of used batteries. The contaminated earth is fenced in with a chalk, chalk with a chain link fence and subdivided by intersecting paths to form an X. The project boundaries are circumscribed by a square Chin conceived this visual overlay as a target, as a target, a metaphor for reference to pinpointing the cleanup. The divisions are also functional, separating different varieties of plants from each other for study. Dr. Rufus uh, Cheney and Chin selected six kinds of plants known as hyperaccumulators that extract zinc and cadmium through their roots into the leaves and then store these elements in their biomass. Among the varieties tested were hybrids of sweet corn and bladder campion. They prepared the soil by wearing special suits, face masks, and gloves. And prior to their work, they were required to attend 40 hours of hazardous material incident response training. Uh, revival field in this case, dramatizes the variety of, of work re unrelated to art uh, that is necessary to implement uh, ecological art. <coughs> and this is the uh, picture of the first harvest. <coughs> Helen Meyer Harrison and Newton Harrison um, the art of the Harrisons has expanded over time to encompass large and complex ecosystems. Their work evolved from individual acts that dramatize the elemental components of life and its nutrients, making earth, growing food, and creating small aquatic ecosystems for raising crabs as an inexpensive means to feed the world's growing population. Since 1977, the Harrisons have investigated various aspects of watersheds and proposed solutions to maintain their delicate balance. Watersheds, fra fragile drainage basins, are critical in terms of maintaining biodiversity and ensuring the quality of water, especially in light of the ever encroaching human settlements. By concentrating on these types of ecosystems, the artist's focus has become increasingly more global because their work involves the large, large territories of uh, the largest territories of any artist discuss, it must by necessity be conceptual. Most artists study and remediate particular sites which are often fairly small. By contrast, the Harrisons have accepted the challenge of interpreting bodies of land and water that often cross national boundaries. As a result, their art is as distinct and complex as the ecosystems that they seek to preserve. All of their work is deeply embedded in the story of place, communicating through maps, collage, photographs accompany, accompanied by poetic narration or dialogue, and sometimes uh, performances by the artist. As Newton Harrison has remarked, we are storytellers. 
out of and out of the art and, and our art is about direct engagement. The Harrisons are concerned with opening lines of communication between community, civic organizations, and government. And the power of their art resides as much in the artist's thoughts and impression as in the visual documentation of the place. With their work, the Harrisons revive and reconnect to an important tradition of communication, which is all but lost in an industrial society today. Their power of storytelling in societies past and present has always been great. The telling and retelling of particular tales have nurtured the spirit and influence of the actions of, of many great cultures. And it is within this context that the Harrisons have created a unique and personal form of, of ecological art. I'd like to conclude with a quote from, three, from, a, from o over a hundred years ago, and it was by Chief Seattle. He said, every part of the earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every clearing and humming insect is wholly in the memory and experience of my people. The sap which courses through the trees carries the memories of the Indian. We are part of the earth and it is part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters, the deer, the horse, the great eagle, they are our brothers. The rocky crest, the juices in the meadow, the body heat of the pony and the humans all belong to the same family. He went on to also say, we know that the white man does not understand our ways. One portion of land is the same to him as the next, for he is a stranger who comes in and takes from the land whatever he needs. The earth is not his brother, but his enemy, and when he has conquered it, he moves on. He leaves his father's graves behind, and he does not care. He kidnaps the earth from his children, and he does not care. His father's grave and his children's birthrights are forgotten. He treats his mother, the earth, and his brother, the sky, as things to be bought, plundered, sold like sheep for bright beads. His appetite will devour the earth and leave behind only a desert. There is a movement within this, this country, uh, indeed within the world, that could counteract this dire prediction. But in order for it to succeed, it needs and it must become a passion. And it must be a passion of the human spirit. Thank you.